Thank you. Uh, you know, as mentioned, I've spent most of my career trying to understand the causes of depression, uh, anxiety disorders, PTSD, and, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about resilience. Uh, going back about 25 or 30 years ago, uh, my colleagues and I, yeah, we should start there, uh, decided also to study resilience because we thought if we could understand uh, why individuals who uh, face serious trauma in their life were able to rise above it, in other words, they were resilient, that we could uh, develop new treatments for anxiety and depression and also help people uh, to become more resilient. So I'm going to summarize uh, uh, some of the work that we've done. I got a 20 minute problem too, so I'll, uh, uh, there'll be some slides I go through uh, fast and if we could make my talk available uh, to you know, people who've come, I'm fine with that. So um, what I hope that you could take out of this lecture um, is that uh, psychological stress does affect the brain. Uh, we have begun to understand the, the mechanisms of human resilience. You can train yourself to become a more resilient person. And I, I hope that you find what I'm going to talk about may have implications uh, for your own life. The way we studied resilience, uh, I'm talking about my colleague Steve Southwick and I, was to identify individuals and groups uh, that were resilient. Uh, and we started out not knowing what it took to become a resilient person. So uh, we were learners uh, in the beginning. So we've, we've interviewed uh, hundreds of people that I think, you know, that if you knew about them, you would say they are uh, resilient. And through all that work, uh, we developed essentially a prescription to become a more resilient person. And I'm going to share uh, that with you today. These are some of the individuals that we learned from. Uh, this is Jerry White. Uh, when he was a young man, he stepped on a landmine in Israel. He lost his leg. Uh, he ultimately decided to do something about it and form the Landmine Survivors Network. Uh, Princess Diana was very involved with that, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1987. Uh, we became very friendly with Jerry to understand how did he overcome uh, losing a leg as an 18-year-old and then deciding to uh, change the world. Um, a very different individual was Deborah Gruen, who my family knew uh, literally when she was born, and she was born with a congenital condition called spina bifida, uh, which causes a short stature, problems with uh, reproductive uh, function and walking. But from day one, uh, Deborah said, uh, I'm, I'm not going to be disabled. And ultimately, uh, she became valedictorian of her high school, went to Yale, swam on the swim team, uh, won uh, not because she was going to win, because she was disabled, but because she was a role model for the other uh, Yale swimmers, ultimately won gold medals, became a lawyer, and now is a prominent lawyer in New York City. Why was she uh, so much able to do that? I'll mention a little bit about that going forward. We also learned a lot from the POWs from Vietnam, and this was a real honor for us uh, to get to interview and become friends with many of the prin uh, prisoners of war from uh, Vietnam. And these were about 800 individuals, most of them that were uh, shot down, uh, they were fighter pilots, they were taken to the prison in Hanoi that was nicknamed the Hanoi Hilton uh, by Bob Shoemaker. They were heavily tortured. Uh, and we wanted to understand why when they got out uh, were they so uh, successful. John McCain is somebody you're familiar with, but there are many other heroes from uh, that group. And these are some drawings by John McGrath that illustrates what they went through. Uh, many of them were put in solitary confinement uh, for years. Imagine that, uh, where they weren't allowed to talk and they were kept in solitary confinement. And we asked them, you know, how did they uh, deal with that? Well, one, one thing that they told us that subsequently led to some research that we uh, ended up doing, that when they were in solitary confinement and all they could do was think, their capacity to think, their capacity to do mathematics, um, to write books in their mind uh, and, and do such things was markedly enhanced. Uh, one POW, uh, Luke Galante, told us that he got to the point 
that he could multiply 12 numbers by 12 numbers in his mind. He lost it when he got out, but it speaks to neuroplasticity. Uh, Bob Shoemaker, who we became particularly friendly with, uh, built a house in his mind, room by room, cabinet by cabinet, etc. And when we met him, he was having a fight with his wife, Elaine, because she wanted to renovate the kitchen. <laughs> and he said, no way, you know, that was not going to happen. So the solitary confinement was obviously very stressful, and they were physically uh, tortured. Uh, these are some examples. Uh, this uh, is the ropes, where it, frequently their shoulders were dislocated. Uh, when they were confined, they were physically tortured. And they were waterboarded. So this is waterboarding, uh, where you are, you are held in that position, water goes across your face, and you feel like you are suffocating. Now, how did they handle that? Now, one thing uh, that was very important to them is they developed a tap code. They weren't allowed to talk, but they, it was very important them, for them to communicate with, with each other. And this is the tap code. So if you tapped once, that meant row one. And then if you tap three times, that is the third letter in that row. Uh, you, you could see there's no K. So a C uh, stood for K. And they were ahead of their time. So instead of spelling Y-O-U, they just used U. So they, they used abbreviations that now are used in text messages. But this goes back to the 1970s. This tap code is really important for their psychological survival. Everybody needs a tap code in life. Physical exercise was very important to them when they were in their cells, as it is you know, now to be resilient. Some of the most defiant of the POWs were put in a specific part of the camp that was nicknamed Camp Alcatraz. And we were able to interview almost everybody from that uh, group. And most of the, those uh, POWs became very uh, successful. Some became admirals. Uh, some became representatives. In Congress, uh, Samuel Johnson was represented from uh, Texas. Uh, Jeremiah Denton became a senator from Alabama, and, and so on. This is Bob Shoemaker when he uh, was released in 1973. This is a very famous uh, picture. His son eventually became a neurosurgeon. So some of the things we learned from the POWs and literally the hundreds of other people that we interviewed were these factors. One is um, to have a positive attitude, to be optimistic. Optimist, um, optimism is very strongly related uh, to resilience. It is in part genetic, uh, but you, it can be learned. Uh, genes are not destiny uh, here. A lot of research has been done to determine what part of the brain relates to uh, optimistic uh, behavior. Also, number two is what we call cognitive flexibility in terms of reappraising what happened to you. Traumatic experiences can be reevaluated. Uh, the perceived value and the meaningfulness of the event uh, can happen. And ultimately, you can achieve what's called post-traumatic uh, growth. I studied I've been studying resilience for uh, 25 years. And you know, I never knew um, if I was resilient. Because uh, you know, I'm a Vietnam era uh, individual, but I didn't go to Vietnam. I had a college deferment than a medical school uh, deferment. But in uh, August 30th of 2016, I was the victim of a violent crime. Uh, I was shot by a disgruntled faculty member with a shotgun from about 20 feet away. And I still have the pellets in my uh, shoulder. I'm fine. But uh, it gave me the opportunity to determine if I was resilient and whether the factors that we identified were uh, valid. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to allude to that a little bit. So I found I'm a, I tend to be a positive person. Uh, so I was optimistic that I was going to recover. And I did uh, and essentially reappraise you know, what happened to me. You know, it's not in the, your roadmap of life that you're going to be shot. Uh, but it happened. And I tried to determine you know, what, what meaning was that going to have you know, for me. And my recovery was very public, because I'm the dean of a medical school. 
And, so, and I was hospitalized at Mount Sinai. And uh, the, my doctors took care of me, and, and the students uh, there uh, were very involved. And so the meaning that I took and the reappraisal that I took of that was that I could be then a role model for our own students and faculty. And ultimately, they, they formed an award in my honor, which I tell the students, that's the best award I've ever uh, gotten. Now, optimism, you know, it's not Pollyanna optimism. You know, if you're optimistic about something that you're not going to be able to overcome, uh, that gets you in trouble. And this is what's called the Stockdale Paradox. Uh, Jim Stockdale was one of the POWs. And that is, yes, you do retain faith that in the end you will prevail. That's optimism. But you got to confront the brutal facts of what you're facing and, and feel that you have developed essentially a psychological toolbox to overcome what you're facing. So you've got to face the reality of your situation. And ultimately, you have a, a toolbox to help you get through it. And, and we, we studied this in many different populations. Subsequently, we studied a, uh, a group of Pakistani citizens who uh, had to deal with an earthquake that killed 250,000 people. Uh, one of our colleagues went to that part of the world, ended up interviewing uh, those individuals uh, in Urgu, the, the language, and found, found in that population, when you measure the degree of optimism, it related to how well they did. You need to embrace a moral compass. Now, for some people, that's religion in the traditional sense. Uh, for others, it's a sense of morality, of doing the right thing. Uh, you know, having the sense that no matter what happened to you, you're still the same person. You're a good person. Uh, you have a sense of beliefs that very few things uh, can uh, shatter. And altruism is very important in that regard. Uh, mothers Against Drunk Driving. Uh, many of the advocacy groups that try to help others in which uh, their families had suffered, that's very important in becoming resilient, both as an individual and as a, a family. We, we know about the neurobiology of all these uh, factors and are learning more about it. And we studied this too in different populations. Uh, in one population that we studied were an African American population in inner city Washington, D.C. In you know, many respects, D.C. is like a segregated city. You're around Georgetown, uh, it's really nice. Around Howard University Medical Center, crime is a problem. Poverty is a problem. And we wanted to understand how that population, um, in, with some individuals, were able to overcome uh, what they were dealt in life in terms of poverty and uh, abuse and, and other problems. And we found in that population that having a purpose in life, having a sense of a, a moral compass, um, having going to religious service was very important in that population. I think in part because of the faith associated with it, but also the support that you get when you, you go to a church and you're with others who may be facing uh, the same problem. Ironically, you know, in some other populations, in this case the Pakistani population, the, the religion was important, but in this case, in the Pakistani population, uh, many individuals felt they had sinned, and that was the reason that the earthquake hit that part of the world, and those individuals uh, did worse. Some other factors that we found. Find a resilient role model, very important. Role models can be found in one's own life, but it also can uh, be found by, other, uh, by individuals that you've never met, but have suffered some of the same things that you might have had. Imitation is a powerful form of learning. Face your fears. We studied the Navy SEALs, got to know them very well, and uh, the, the Delta Force in the US Army. And you would think, well, you're a Navy SEAL, you're not, you're not uh, you're not afraid. And they said the opposite. You know, that fear is a normal part of life, but it can be used as a guide. You can overcome your fears. You can face them and become a stronger uh, person. You become, and already five minutes, okay. So uh, self-esteem is uh, very important. And we also found that active coping 
was very important. Don't be passive when you're facing difficulties in life. Establish a, a supportive uh, network. Uh, this was very important to me. I have a very strong uh, you know, family, but my medical school was very uh, supportive to me. You can't go through things alone. And uh, it's people that are important to you that can provide you uh, the real support. A safety net in times of stress is very important. And also to attend to physical well-being. And we studied uh, you know, these factors in an objective way with many different populations, including veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. And it bas basically confirmed that these factors were very important. And 9 and 10, you train regularly and rigorously in multiple areas to become a more resilient person. Change requires systematic and disciplined activity going forward. And it's important to recognize your own signature strengths. What are you good at? And how can you enhance that to face challenges in life? So this ultimately is, uh, in a sense, a, a roadmap to becoming more resilient. And in many respects, it starts uh, with a role model. And then these other elements come into play. And we have also found that using these factors can uh, help in treatment of certain psychiatric diseases uh, like depression. Uh, this is uh, something we published in Science uh, several years ago. A word about stress inoculation. Now, this work has had implications uh, for me and my family in terms of raising my children. So I have five children and now seven grandchildren. And in, in raising my five children, they, they said that I got tougher on them when I started studying resilience. <laughs> and they're right. Because if you raise your children a stress-free environment, they don't be, they're not prepared. So I did stress my kids. I didn't traumatize them, but I stressed them. Putting them in semi-dangerous situations. Uh, you know, we talked yesterday a little bit about nature and adventure, and uh, I did that. I, I have permission just to tell one vignette. Uh, when one of my daughters was 13, uh, we were on a hike. We were in a mountain. Uh, it was sort of dangerous. Uh, wildlife was there. A storm came in, and she said to me that she despised me. <laughs> <laughs> it came out of her soul. Okay. Well, she's now, you know, 35, a mother of two, and, uh, you know, wh what does she do uh, in winter? She goes to Yellowstone. So th this b b had an impact on her. But if I hadn't intervened in a sense, you know, maybe she was going to be scared going forward. So we know a lot about the biology of resilience. I, ca I can't go into that, but let me just say we, we know about the pathways. We know about the neurotransmitters. And I'll end by just uh, mentioning some of the studies we're doing to take advantage of that. So we, we found uh, that one particular uh, neuropeptide called, called neuropeptide Y, which is found in everybody's brain and has angiolytic properties, uh, might be have a possibility for new treatment of anxiety, depression, and uh, PTSD, because we found it went up under stress and helped mitigate stress. And so we, over the last literally 10 years, have been working to develop neuropeptide Y as a treatment. So we've had neuropeptide Y made. Uh, we have begun to uh, give it uh, intranasal to get it past the blood-brain barrier. And, uh, along with some collaborators who have given neuropeptide Y to rats uh, who were under stress, and it was shown to mitigate the anxiety and stress in these animals, we have begun a clinical trial uh, in patients with PTSD where we have, we're giving neuropeptide Y. So we have permission from the FDA to do this. We're going to continue this, uh, uh, this trial and see if we can develop it as a new treatment and perhaps to enhance uh, resilience. Ketamine was mentioned. Uh, you know, we developed ketamine as an antidepressant. 
It's now marketed as uh, Sprebato, but now we're also studying it uh, in PTSD and possibly as a prophylactic against uh, stress-induced depression and PTSD. And if it, people have questions about it, I'll let you know, but we are actively giving ketamine uh, to patients with PTSD, have had one positive trial, and uh, now we're also testing it if we give it prior to stress, whether it will prevent the effects of stress. So let me end uh, with this. The goal of my research and many other researchers who are studying resilience is to understand, and this is from 9-11, why, you know, how can this fireman be going up when everybody else is going down? You know, what is in him uh, to be able to do that? This is from Katrina. Uh, and you can see these volunteers going to save people at great personal risk to themselves. And now New Orleans may be facing something uh, similar. And you know, this is a longer story, but if you understand human resilience at the individual level, what does that mean about development of resilient communities, resilient cities, and maybe even resilient nations? And at some point we could talk more about that. Thank you very much.